So to my far right is Dr. Eduardo Franco, who many of you know. He's a professor of epidemiology and oncology and director of Division of Cancer Epidemiology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He's got many accolades, many awards, and we've all, I'm sure, many of us heard him speak before. Beside him is Dr. Lori Margaret Ellett. Uh, Lori is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at McMaster University, and she is also a gynecological oncologist at the Jurovinsky Cancer Center and Henderson Hospital, which is part of the Hamilton Health Sciences Center. And to my immediate right is Dr. Marc Stabin, who is a family practitioner and a medical advisor at the STI unit of Quebec's National Public Health Issue. Um, he chairs Quebec's Province Committee on STI and member of the STI Laboratory Analysis Committee. And I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I have the distinct pleasure of being your moderator for the next one hour. So, Laurie, I'm going to start this conversation by asking you the first question. And the first question really is, is that in a post-colposcopy setting, is there a role for HPV vaccination in a woman treated for HPV-related diseases? The mandatory disclosures. These disclosures are very long, but I think it actually speaks to the fact that you are all such brilliant speakers that everybody wants you to speak at their meetings. Okay. What is our daily challenge with HPV-related cervical disease? So I'm going to answer this question in two different ways. Uh, first of all, as many of you know, cancer is a big problem globally, and 18% of cancers are due to infectious diseases. 5% of that 18% is actually due to HPV-related diseases such as cervical cancer. So globally, this is a huge problem. Looking more at the Ontario perspective, we screen roughly 1.6 million women annually in the province between the ages of 21 and 69 years old. There is approximately a 15% prevalence rate of HPV uh, viral infection, but the real problem is in that 5% of women who have abnormal screens. Roughly 1,500 women a year have um, uh, the incidence of cervical cancer, and about a third to a quarter of those will die of cervical cancer um, in this country. So you can see that a huge number of resources goes into identifying and then managing women with HPV-related disease. So HPV is also linked with other genital cancers. What is the impact on a woman's overall health? So as many people in this room know, um, HPV is the uniform cause for cervical cancer, and um, it is responsible for 100% of the disease and 70% of that is related to HPV oncogenic types 16 and 18. But there are also other diseases that are associated with HPV infection. Um, about 50% of vulvovaginal cancers are related to HPV disease. Anal cancer, we're getting more and more information around oral pharyngeal cancers um, so that the issue of oncogenic HPV is much broader than just causing cervical-related diseases and cancers. Okay, Mark, certainly you spend a lot of your time dealing with STIs and genital warts, and certainly there's a burden of genital warts on patients. Can you speak to that issue? Yeah, genital warts uh, are not only very common, but they have far more than being lesions on the genital tract that you have to burn. Off. Uh, so there was a great study that was done in Canada about the psychosocial impact, not only of cervical cancer, but also in condyloma. And we we're looking into uh, uh, the impact in, in both males and female. And this is very small, but uh, we were able to see across Canada for both male and female significant impact on many uh, um, items on their, uh, uh, on their quality of life. And uh, we were able to see that uh, not only uh, they had tremendous effect, impact on their quality of life, but also that patient needed long treatment. And, uh, and a lot of these patients needed two different treatment even to get rid of their anal uh, genital wart. 
uh, an interesting study that was done uh, previously to the Canadian study, and uh, we were able to see the HPV impact uh, profile, uh, and uh, it's uh, quite interesting to see that uh, uh, women that were diagnosed with uh, CIN23 confirmed by a biopsy had exactly the same HPV impact uh, on the, uh, their quality of life as uh, genital wart. And it's very easy for us to trivialize because they're not associated with cancer, but still there's a huge impact on the quality of life of a patient. Can you walk us through the latest HPV primary prevention results with the vaccine trials? Uh, as we know, there were uh, many studies done with the uh, quadrivalent uh, HPV vaccine, and uh, we have uh, long-term follow-up uh, data for at least two of these uh, studies. So in, the, in four of the Nordic countries, uh, there's a long-term effectiveness uh, study that uh, should go on for 20 years. And what we know uh, for the women that were followed for at least four years uh, after the end uh, of the study, uh, we were able to see that there were no uh, HPV 1618-related CIN2 uh, plus or cervical cancer, and there were no HPV 611-1618 related CIN or vulvar or vaginal uh, cancer. So these women um, uh, are showing a trend of continuing protection for up to nine years. And in the adolescent study, uh, where only security and immunogenicity uh, uh, endpoints were measured, uh, we were able to see the difference uh, between those that were immunized at the beginning of the study and those that were immunized at the end of the study. So now we're able to see the long-term follow-up uh, of the early vaccination group compared to the catch-up vaccination group. And uh, uh, we're able to see that there were eight times more uh, uh, adolescent that were seropositive uh, for HPV uh, for those that were immunized at the end of the study compared to those that were immunized at the beginning of the study. Uh, and that was only 2.5 year difference between uh, those two uh, time. And of course, in, in the meantime, some of the adolescents became sexually active. Uh, and uh, for those that became sexually active, we were able to see that there were uh, two uh, cases of uh, 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 persistent infection in female, two in uh, the male. Uh, the two in the female were HPV-16. In the male, it was one six and one was 16, but no clinical endpoints were seen uh, in uh, those patients. So both studies shows that uh, there's long-term efficacy that confers the preliminary result we had at the end of the study. Although the fact that this is one of the most widely studied vaccines, the whole safety controversy still exists. Patients are exposed to a lot of confusion between the media and the internet and a variety of sources where they get their information. They're not always getting their information from a clinician. So despite the fact that there's widespread monitoring, why and what does the data look like? Uh, I think HPV vaccine, will have been the most studied vaccine in terms of safety. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that not only the manufacturer is keeping track on the side effect, but in Canada, we have Health Canada uh, safety uh, 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 website where people, not only professional, but people can uh, describe uh, adverse event and uh, all the provinces and territories in Canada have their own safety monitoring board, especially in Quebec, where there's a no fault for adverse event uh, program available. And we're not seeing adverse event higher that we would expect in that uh, population. So uh, a lot of publication from uh, JAMA and uh, a lot of licensing body. We know that WHO, even FIGO, uh, CDC, uh, even in Spain, uh, so we know that many health authorities reaffirm the positive safety profile of Gardasil. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we hear a lot about the side effects, the, uh, the systemic side effect, and we're not seeing them. Of course, it's a vaccine, and like all vaccine, there will be side effects at the site of the injection, but that's the most we can say about adverse event and the vaccine. So, Lori, when the vaccine first came out, we certainly focused on that 9 to 14-year-old and then the 26-year-old and then the midlife woman. But the question is about patients who have already had a previous abnormal pap. 
So if we take someone who's around 30 or so and has had a previously abnormal pap, can you speak to us about the advantages or disadvantages? Is it too late to consider vaccinating at this point with an HPV vaccine? So I'm going to take you back to the um, bivalent study, which was done in a younger population than the 30-year-old that um, the question is evolved. And in that particular study, um, there was a large majority of the women who were naive to any exposure to HPV. Um, there was another group of women, a smaller proportion, who had DNA um, evidence that they'd had a previous exposure, a serum DNA, um, but um, did not currently have any evidence of disease at the level of the cervix HPV testing. And then there was a much smaller group who had actually HPV 16 or 18 at the level of the cervix. So if we uh, look now at the women who were 18 to 25 years old, and we look at what happened to their outcome when they were randomized between getting the vaccine or not, what you can see is that the vaccine had a very excellent um, protection um, against a subsequent disease in those who were completely naive. Um, the risk of, um, or the benefit of the vaccine, I should say, in those who were serum positive um, was slightly less, but still quite high and statistically significant. In the group who um, had evidence of um, HPV 16 at the level of the cervix, they had an excellent protection against HPV-18 from the vaccine. Likewise, in the group that had HPV-18 at the level of the cervix, they had an excellent um, protection against HPV-16 from the vaccine. Um, and the overall rate of protection to both was high, not as high as in the naive group. The group who had no benefit at all to the vaccination was the group who were HPV 16 and 18 positive at the level of the cervix. So what this says is in a slightly younger cohort than the one that we're focusing on, that there is a benefit um, of the vaccine um, to women who have had previous either um, exposure at the level of knowing their serum is positive or having had exposure to one or the other of the um, HPV 16 or 18 currently in the cervix. Just to be balanced, um, there is equal information about the quadrivalent vaccine that in those who have had um, previous disease who um, received um, the vaccine um, in the randomized study for the quadrivalent uh, group, there was equal protection against future um, disease uh, from that um, vaccine exposure. Not as high as in the naive group, but certainly at an excellent rate. So now if we go on to our post-colposcopy setting and we look at women who have had a colposcope, they've been treated for an HPV-related disease, but however their um, surgeon has decided to treat them. What about this group in terms of HPV vaccination? So we don't have any randomized data about uh, women who have had a CIN two or three treated and then they get randomized to get the vaccine or not get the vaccine. But we do have data from the upfront vaccine trials to help us understand uh, this information. So in the randomized trial where women were randomized between the quadrivalent or the placebo group, what happened um, to those women who had had treatment in terms of what happened in the future after they had been exposed to the vaccine. So in this population, there were roughly 17 and a half thousand women enrolled. And of those who had disease, who got treatment, there were 587 who got the vaccine and 763 who had the placebo. And what you can see in this slide and in the subsequent slide was that in a period of time of follow-up, the rate of disease in the vaccinated group um, was lower than in the group who got the placebo arm. So just to dis demonstrate this a little bit differently, um, you can see that the rate of any kind of disease, um, genital warts, CIN1, 2, 3, or 4, 
or higher was 45% less than the vaccinated group, 48% less for CIN1 or worse disease, and 65% less in the vaccinated group in terms of developing CIN2 or higher disease. Um, this is a different study that came out of Korea. It's published online, but not yet in the journal. It's coming. Um, and this is a group of roughly 750 women who um, had treatment for CIN2 or higher by LEAP. And then they were followed over roughly a four-year period of time after that procedure. Each woman after her LEAP procedure, one week later, was offered vaccination or not vaccination. And they broke out roughly into two equal groups, the group that got the quadrivalent vaccine and the group that didn't. Not randomized, prospective, but what it showed was that there was a higher risk of recurrent disease in the group who chose not to get vaccinated versus the group who chose to get vaccinated. So both of these um, studies, one um, looking at the um, a secondary analysis of the original randomized vaccine trials, and here another study out of Korea um, where women had a choice to get vaccinated or not after their initial treatment for CIN2 or higher, are both showing indications that vaccination um, will protect against future disease um, once um, you've received that opportunity. So we have a lot of women who are very confused by the later age of doing PAPs, now at 21, and doing them every three years, and we're trying to walk them through why we think that should be done. Um, but now we also have an, the arrival of these vaccinated birth cohorts, these women who have received the vaccine, um, and they're reaching cervical screening age, are now hitting 21 where we're beginning to screen them. Are we going to see an impact on screening? Most likely. Uh, in, in, at the same time, we're having all of these good news on the vaccination front. We're also having a lot of activity, a lot of technological advances on the screening part independently. So for the past 15 years or so, there have been... Uh, a great deal of uh, knowledge has come along uh, in terms of improvements in, uh, in, uh, in cervical cancer screening, the advent of HPV-based uh, screening, uh, the variety of uh, FDA-approved tests, Health Canada-approved tests now. Uh, these changes eventually are going in parallel with the progress that you just saw uh, on the vaccination front. Except that this is going to, in, to lead to something that we need to prepare ourselves, and it has already started. Canada uh, has been very successful in uh, uh, with coverage of HPV vaccination. We're not exactly a, an early adopting country. I mean, we're a second or third country to adopt uh, in 2009 uh, HPV vaccination. But we have achieved throughout uh, across Canada, among most provinces, a very high vaccination coverage. So uh, we have, Australia was the first country to exper experience that the, with the impact of vaccination. You, you could make the analogy with Niagara River here. If you put a dam on the Niagara River here, eventually the flow in the, in, in the, the water in the, the falls is going to trickle down to in terms of volume. So it's more or less the same situation here. When we look at the natural history of cervical cancer, as we dam the river upstream and with a, a very efficacious vaccine, as, as you just saw in the summary of, uh, of the trials, eventually the prevalence of lesions is going to decrease. Of course, it's going to take some time because we're vaccinating mostly uh, girls in uh, uh, high school age, but as they gradually, as, as Dr. Shapiro mentioned, as they age, eventually they reach the age of screening, it's going to create an interesting situation because the whole concept of screening is based on, as this graph, uh, uh, indicates on the, it predicates on, on having good positive predictive value. So you folks operate as gynecologists, primary care providers, on, on the premise that a, a positive PEP test has a certain probabilistic statement in terms of what that represents in terms of an existing lesion to that, that woman. So that probabilistic statement is generally high, and I would invite you to look at diagonal, which shows prevalence of 10% and and 5%, bear with me on the graph here, it's a little complicated, but uh, just to illustrate the impact of what vaccination is going to do. So there are two curves in each one of these graphs. The top curve is, uh, represents the specificity for the existing paradigm of cervical cancer screening, which is cytology, if we take that as our, 
as our uh, paradigm here in Canada, of 98% specificity, and we, we have known this. Cytology, the expect, spectacular thing about cytology is very high specificity, very low false positive rate. The lower curve is about 95%, so these are all estimates in terms of project what the future is going to be. And if you look at the x-axis, this is the sensitivity of, of, uh, of cytology, which we know uh, has been the weak, weak spot of uh, cervical cancer screening cytology. It's uh, a little over 50%, some places 60%. So with vaccination, what's going to happen is we're going to decrease prevalence of lesions. It has already started. Australia was the first country to observe that with a substantial reduction in, uh, in, in the rate of cervical abnormalities. Other countries are seeing exactly the same thing. The U.S. Has, has observed that, and even in Canada we have preliminary data that it, it is already having an impact uh, at least some of the opportunistic uh, vaccination we have seen. With the decrease of prevalence, we're going to have just an expected decrease in the pause predictive value. So it's more or less from the zone where we are today of 10% and 5% operating in the blue curve uh, uh, along the lines of a 60% uh, sensitivity. We're comfortably in the situation today, before vaccination ensues, that most positive results by cytology represents something to act upon, which the, there'll be a, 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 an actionable endpoint, there'll be a clinical action that, 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 that is relevant. Now, if you look at the bottom, the bottom graph on, on, uh, on the right-hand side, imagine the world with, where vaccine eventually has the intended effect of reducing prevalence of lesions. So at that point, we also, for a variety of reasons, we also expect that sensitivity in the specificity of cytology will decline. So we would move from the blue to the red curve. Sensitivity is not going to be such a, uh, an important issue. As you can see, it's almost a flat line uh, against the x-axis. But we're going to be in a situation as we move to the left and down from the blue to the red in that 1% graph where most positive results are going to be false. They're going to be false positive results and they're going to imply action to that woman, to that young patient that it could potentially cause harm. So the, the only world that's not capturing that in that slide that does not exist today, the future world of vaccination is the 1%. Today's world of, of uh, lesions today is the 10% and the 5% prevalence. But there's a future world in which we can enrich the, the tray of smears that's going to the cytotech, and that's the world of uh, uh, where we use a different test to do this, the initial screening of women in a future primary screening program, which we could have in Canada, we may eventually have in Canada, one in which we use a HPV-based screening. So eventually that tray of smears that comes from women who are HPV positive will be enriched again. So the, the reward for the cytotechnician, for the cytopathologist, that not only the work volume will reduce is about tenfold, but also it's a more rewarding experience because we're again in a zone of operation in which prevalence of lesions is high again. Okay, so. I'm going to ask you a three-pronged question. A study in India showed that a single pap does not reduce a woman's chance of dying of cervical cancer, but doing HPV screening can reduce it by 50%. The Americans talk about doing paps every three years. We talk about doing paps every three years, but if you co-test HPV and pap, you can extend it to five years. You've addressed the fact that the sensitivity with the pap is 40 to 60%. Sensitivity with HPV screening is maybe 95%, although it may overcall lesions that may disappear. So the question is, is, one, how does screening need to be changed, both with respect to frequency? Are we co-testing? Should we be changing what we're doing? Um, do you predict that we are going to move towards an algorithm of HPV testing alone? It's interesting that the Americans are PAP alone or co-testing, but no statement. And if you look at the co-testing, it will only maybe pick up 12 to 15% more than HPV testing alone. So a multi-pronged question, and you can wrestle with that. Well, on the, on the tail end of your, of your comment there, of course, I mean, this is the, which is an important issue of cost effectiveness. So we do, of course, the U.S. is operating now with co-testing in a zone of maximum safety. And, of course, the maximum cost as well uh, for, for the woman. Is that the ideal situation here in Canada? Well, we know, we have seen from the evidence that has uh, come along in the pipeline of uh, research in the last uh, 15 years or so, that the brute force that's been done on the de detection of these lesions is done by by the HPV test. There's the flip side of this question, which is what is the value for the vast majority of women who undergo screening, they have a negative result. So that's the importance for them. So a negative PAP result versus a negative HPV test result have considerably different 
uh, probabilistic statements in terms of safety for that woman. And that's the reason we have, for seven decades or so, done annual PEP tests, biannual PEP tests, and now we're going to triannual PEP tests. At most, we cannot, we cannot tolerate them going to four or five, like our Scandinavian colleagues do, where they have organized programs. In Canada, we have to keep uh, at least the frequency tight enough to be able to maintain safety in our screening programs. But with HPV testing, on the other hand, we'll be able to safely extend screening intervals and uh, without having to, to go to co-test. My, my hunch is that eventually, as many uh, countries are, uh, in Europe are moving on now, is to a primary basis of HPV testing, serial with eventually uh, triage with uh, cytology, or triage even with another molecular angle of HPV testing, such as genotyping, and eventually even cytology would have a role also in uh, helping risk stratification in the, in the long run. Uh, whether you folks are going to be doing different policies for women who are vaccinated or not is a, is a very important question right now. And uh, when you look at the, the, the reasoning that uh, the uh, U.S. task force as well as the American Cancer Society, the SCP, SCP uh, consortium guidelines, which was convened in 2012, the working group decided that, that for the United States, for instance, they didn't have enough safety built into the system in terms of certainty that vaccination coverage is high enough. It's not in the U.S., unlike the situation in Canada. There are no registries for who was vaccinated, who was not. So for you to rely on the history of a woman that she was vaccinated without having a firm evidence that she was vaccinated uh, is, is not uh, uh, a, a uh, will not give you the, co the confidence yet to move. So for the time being, policies are the same uh, in terms of screening post-vaccination, but the, the reality is that for countries like Canada, in which we have a little better control on the surveillance, and eventually registries, vaccination registry will start, we'll be able to control that a little better, and eventually with time, uh, there will be a change in, in the status quo. In 15 or 30 years, eventually as new vaccines come along, there is a new generation of vaccines, an invalid vaccine, which has been submitted for uh, approval with FDA and Health Canada, and we expect that the, the turn of, as we get into 2015, uh, we're going to have a new vaccine, which is going to extend the range of protection enormously. So this gives, gives a, an even greater urgency to the need for us to rethink screening post-vaccination. In fact, in Canada, we're doing that. CPAC and other uh, uh, centralized uh, bodies are, are doing that now. But Eduardo, data tell us, shows us that about 30% of women have had, with invasive cervical disease, had a normal PAP three years ago, and 31% of them had a normal HPV test five years before the invasive disease. Still leaves us wondering who we're missing. That's right. But uh, as, uh, as we do in any other areas in cancer in general, forget gynecology, oncology, or, or prevention of cervical cancer, uh, we don't screen when, when the disease we want to detect becomes so rare to the point that the harms that would come from the screening would overwhelm, would, would exceed the potential benefits of preventing disease, then we're in a point where we have as a society to decide collectively. That's the situation, for instance, by analogy that we, we use for childhood cancers. We could do screening for a number of childhood cancers, yet this is, is not done because of the cost, because of the morbidity that eventually come to that. We'll get to that point someday. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we'll consider ourselves successful if we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come back to you now. So, how do you see healthcare for the professional involved in HPV primary prevention in sexually active women in evolving? Where, where are we going? I think that uh, um, we have to be sexual health advocates for women and also for men. And I think that uh, advocating is seeing the best for our patient. I think that we need clear messaging, and I hear frequently patients that have not received the vaccine taught by the tone that was given to the vaccine message that it was not so important. Uh, I think we have to be clear that we're advocating uh, for the best care. Comprehensive approach also tried not only to look at what the needs of the patient uh, express are, but also to look at needs they don't necessarily uh, know. Uh, I frequently hear that women didn't know that there was benefit of being immunized against HPV because the vaccine was not free, like the girls in the school. So they thought because the vaccine was not free, 
sent the message that it was not a value for them. So comprehensive approach, so looking at what they need and not asking for. And I think that uh, we have to be clear that uh, we're the gatekeepers for prevention and there's uh, certainly for primary prevention much more needs that are unfelt and uh, they don't know, they don't ask questions, uh, or they don't feel they're, that they're in the risk population. And uh, we're seeing in most of the generation of women that come to the clinic that uh, uh, sexual mores have evolved. And uh, we're, we're not surprised to see many women uh, saying they're married to have uh, other spouse, they're in an open relationship, but no one has ever asked questions about their sexuality. Uh, so primary prevention, so uh, about uh, doing uh, the, the nice and comprehensive message about HPV vaccine, and also to be sure that those that need screening receive the screening uh, they need. And uh, I think it's good that you uh, talk about uh, prevention and frequently uh, prevention in adults is not as well supported as it is for uh, young uh, people. And uh, it's clearly shown in our waiting room where we have plasma screens uh, and we have at least six of our plasma screen that rolls all the time in the waiting room that uh, HPV uh, vaccine for men, HPV vaccine for women. We even have some message and we even have some high definition videos uh, on our uh, website and we have a frequent message on our Facebook account of the clinic uh, talking about uh, HPV uh, and how important it is uh, not only to get treated when you have it, but you can prevent it outside of the population that receive free uh, vaccine. So we know that once a first impression is made, it's almost impossible to change it in the general public's viewpoint, even when there's overwhelming evidence. Did we shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak, when we made this a gender biased disease? Because when the vaccine first came out, it was girls and are our girls guinea pigs, and there was the emphasis on the cervix as opposed to HPV causing disease, as Laurie so eloquently pointed out, all the different areas that impact. So I think that we're sort of crawling out from underneath this, trying to redirect and re inform our patients about human papillomavirus as a vector for disease. What happens in your office on a primary care basis where you can have the discussion not only with girls or women who need catch up or midlife women or men? It's, it's a big agenda. Uh, of course, we started by advocating the vaccine in women because we had the data for women. The burden of the disease in the world is on women's uh, shoulder. But as uh, data for men came, we incorporated the message for for uh, not only women, but also for men. And we have so many women coming to the clinic. Now they have adolescent, uh, they have their daughter immunized and they don't realize that uh, uh, men have uh, a burden on themselves and that men can be vector to uh, the mother of their grandchildren in the future. So we have to show that HPV is so democratic uh, that uh, a lot of people will be, uh, will be uh, infected and be affected. And we look at the number of women that have to go to counseling with our, our sex therapists, our psychologists. We've seen couples where uh, a, a pap smear or a genital wart uh, in a relationship came and struck very hard. We've seen women not having sexual drive because of an HPV uh, diagnosis. So we are very clear about the value of using HPV uh, prevention. And we know that Dr. Google is certainly very high for women to take decision about their health care, but still, the family physician or the OBGYN is still number one. Women will take their physician uh, uh, recommendation uh, seriously. And of course, uh, and show that you believe in so much your own kids or that you're immunized. So I'm able to say that my two kids uh, are immunized and we have eight young women in the clinic. They're less than 35. All of them are very proud to say, I'm a doctor and I myself immunize against HPV. The message has to be clear and show that you support the message, not only in word, but also in needles. So 
Further expanding on that question, when primary care is so busy doing so much, what are some opening sentences or the way that you can introduce this to a midlife woman or to a male? When is there an opportunity or is every visit an opportunity? I think that most visits are opportunity. Of course, if someone has a broken arm, I think that's not the right time to talk about <laughs> HPV vaccine. <laughs> but I think the main problem we're having is that patients come to the office with an agenda. And uh, I, I think it's good that we open in saying that we're going to take time to see at their overall history and not only at the point they're coming. Having a visit at the doctor's office now is very difficult, and we try to do the one-stop shop. So they come, we ask questions, we look at the global approach of their health, not only their health, but their sexual health, and we also have the vaccine on site. So. Uh, not only uh, clear recommendation, but having access on site on the vaccine helps uh, the uh, initiation of the vaccination. You started today, you have two doses to go. If you don't start today, you have three doses to go. Mm -hmm. So, Lori, along the same, the same theme, um, you come at this from a different angle as an obstetrician and gynecologist. And the question is, is that we know that a lot of OB-GYNs, unlike primary care, don't necessarily do the vaccination themselves in the office. But the question is, is, is there a role for you to be playing? Obviously, I think that there is. And how do you play that role? So as many of you in the room know, the Royal College has a framework for how a medical expert is looked at, either as a medical student or as a resident, or for us as OBGYNs. And there are different aspects of that role that we take on. So first of all, there's the communicator. We have to be prepared to talk with the patient in front of us if they ask specific questions um, about the vaccine, about information on its effectiveness, as well as about um, safety issues. And the prime area for that interaction can be the colposcopy clinic because many of those women are there because of um, HPV-related diseases. Our second role is as a health advocate. Uh, we can advocate uh, by making sure that resources are available to have the patient vaccinated, working with the patient to send them to their family doctor if they so want to pursue the vaccination, or be available to talk with school group girls or mothers and daughters um, to advocate for this part of their health. The third area is medical field, um, being available for colleagues or other groups like family doctors, nursing um, areas to talk to them about the importance of health care in terms of um, making themselves available to be vaccinated or have their children vaccinated. Um, as a professional, we can write the script. We may not give the vaccine, but we could put the script in the hand of the uh, patient in front of us and they can um, have that script filled and go to their family doctor or resource in the community that provides the vaccination. We have to correct misinformation, and that means we have to be current with our knowledge around issues of safety as were previously discussed. And I reiterate the point that was made earlier. When it comes to ourselves, our children, our sisters, our brothers, um, we need to uh, preach what we're, or we need to do what we're preaching is if we highly believe that the vaccine is effective, we need to advocate for that in our families as well. So as we're talking to boys, and about the vaccine who may not see genital warts as something they need to be concerned about because they haven't been impacted by one or they see the risk of anal and penile. Could either you, Dr. Franco or Lori, could you comment on what's happening to the incidence and prevalence of oral pharyngeal head and neck cancers that are HPV related? Just the trends that we're seeing? Well, we have begun as we, as we saw the impact on, uh, I don't think we have a slide on that. No, uh, no, no, uh, I'm just uh, bothering uh, you. Uh, we have begun to see the impact, of course, on genital disease, and uh, with time we expect because of longer latency for the other uh, HPV-associated diseases, but there should be an impact ultimately on oropharyngeal cancers as well. We have seen for the past uh, a couple of decades a, 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 a shift in the epidemiology of, uh, uh, of uh, oral cancers. Uh, the 
the general trend for tobacco and alcohol associated cancers which are on decline uh, because of the successes on tobacco cessation but gradually they're being replaced by uh, a shift on, on the risk factors and HPV associated cancers. The changes well, that we witnessed, we caused ourselves, at least some people in my generation, we did in the 60s uh, and the 70s. Uh, of course, the change in sexual mores that came from the, the post-war generation uh, are now being having an impact on, on cancers associated with HPV. And of course, cervical cancer, we didn't see much on cervical cancer because we adopted in Canada at the right time uh, opportunistic or organized uh, cervical cancer screen exactly at a point when eventually rates of cervical cancer would start going up. There's evidence for that for other countries in the, uh, Finland and the UK, which most of the Western countries adopt at the right moment. We don't have screening for oral cancers, we don't have screening for genital cancers, but in general vaccination is going to have an impact uh, and ultimately will have an impact on what we measure well, which is instance rates of cancers based on uh, using the network of tumor registries that we have in Canada. So it, it's fully expected there's going to be an impact earlier for the genital for the genital outcomes and with time for oral and oropharyngeal cancers and uh, who knows even for more as new vaccines come along they have a broader impact in terms of protection so we'd like to open up the floor for your questions there's lots more that i can ask you but <laughs> i'd like to share the ability to ask the question so if you have a question if you could come up to the microphone if you could identify yourself and ask your question Marla, can I add? Yes, please. Comments? Yeah, just for the, uh, there's a first study that has shown with the vaccine, there's less uh, uh, oral infection in the vaccinated group compared to the control group. So we already have one data. It's about infection. It's not about cancer. Right. But if you decrease infection, you decrease persistence, presumably we're going to decrease cancer. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Susan Goldstein. I'm a family physician from Toronto. Marla, you'll appreciate this. We get a lot of patients who've been to colposcopy clinic, they come back, they haven't necessarily been talked to about the HPV vaccine. I'm a little confused and concerned about the data on the bivalent vaccine because it said, okay, with positive HPV 16, you had 80%, of 18, you still had 100% uh, benefit. But if you had both, it was 4%. Now, we don't get, ser we get only get a result that says you're HPV positive. We aren't told which one you have. We aren't told if there's more than one virus actually present. So how are we supposed to put all that information together to cancel our patients on vaccines, which for some of my clients are still quite expensive. Are you talking expensive. about when you do HPV screening in your office from a broom? Um, either from that or they come back from the CULP clinic and they say they're HPV DNA positive. You don't know if the, what they have and our, if they our have more than one. Our data does say if it's oncogenic or non-oncogenic. Yours has nothing? Just HPV positive? Yep. So most of the tests that are available, like the DiGene test, uh, the Roche test, will tell you that it's oncogenic. Right. It's not that it's non-oncogenic. The tests that are currently available commercially are oncogenic HPV types, and that could be one of 13 or 14, depending on which test you're using. Um, there is a Roche test available, um, which will tell you, is it 16 or 18 or one of the other types? But I'm not advocating to type what's happening at the cervix. What I'm saying is that there's a very small chance that the patient that's in front of you will actually have both 16 and 18 at the cervix at this point in time. And the overarching answer to that question was vaccinating the patient who's either been sexually active or been in CULFO or had treatment for a CIN2 or high lesion is beneficial. The vaccine in the naive patient, HPV naive patient, is the strongest benefit, but there is benefit for everyone else um, in that range of women that could present. Okay, thank you. Over here. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to know about um you know, we're, we're looking at the 80% rule as uh, 16 and 18, and I'm just wondering what's the long-term outlook about all the other HPVs that have been picked on now by the virus? Uh, you, you mentioned in passing about uh, a more, more than a quadrivalent kind of HPV oncogenic you know, vaccine, and will, in the long term, will we have to then 
have HPV tests against the 40s and the 50s and all the other oncogenic vaccines? How is this going to play out in the long term? Is this good for the, the companies that are making the vaccines? Because those keep on having to chase more oncogenic vaccines. And was it a, was it a cost uh, reason that they just picked four vaccines? In other words, that they put five or six, was that much more costly to get to be to put in production and to make the cost of vaccine reasonable? I, I don't know the answer. So can we, well, let's start first with why it was four and what happens, how you build a vaccine. It's the same thing, I guess, why, you know, pneumonia vaccines were, you know, seven and eventually became 13. So can someone speak to the quadrivalent and growing a vaccine? It was one at the beginning. Right. So At the beginning, there was a monovalent HPV-16. So very rapidly, that study was stopped because we saw eye efficacy and safety. So we rolled to the quadrivalent vaccine. And now there's a nine valent vaccine uh, being uh, proposed for the uh, health authorities to, uh, to put on, on the market. And with that vaccine, we're going to have seven high risk uh, HPV uh, that would protect against 90% of cervical cancer and about the same uh, area for anal cancer, vulvar cancer, and vaginal cancer. Lori, did you have a comment? Well, there's, uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, a, a new vaccine that eventually is going to be approved soon, uh, a nine-valent vaccine, which is going to stand, extend the range of protection. Then there is the research pipeline, which is going to bring us eventually a vaccine that's going to be pump mucosotrophic HPV vaccine. So we'll protect against all HPVs that eventually infect the moist skin, mucocutaneous uh, uh, HPVs, the whole alpha papillomavirus, and eventually some, who knows, even the, the beta papillomavirus, which are associated with squamous and basal cell carcinomas. So but this is a future world that eventually is going to come that will reduce substantially HPV-associated disease. But the point uh, related to your question with respect to testing, uh, the existing tests today would, are doing a good job in terms of coverage for all the, te the HPV types that could potentially lead to malignancy, uh, in, in all malignancy that uh, in uh, uh, genital, uh, anal, uh, uh, and certainly for cervical cancer screening. So there's no need right now of rethinking the design of these HPV tests uh, with respect to uh, whether the vaccination has its intended effect, or, and which will. Uh, the existing tests that are approved today, clinically validated, are going to be good for a long, long time. Can I ask? Yes. Can I add? Please. Uh, these facts, the new vaccine is submitted to the health authorities, but I think there's a danger here that uh, we lose uh, the speed we have on our vaccine uh, programs. And I think uh, if there's going to be a better smoke detector in two years, I still keep the one I have and make sure that it's, uh, it's working well. So it's going to come. We don't know the price. We, we don't know if it's going to be on the market. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be a glitch in the development program. So this is the future and the risk of HPV for a lot of our patients that are coming to the clinic is now. So uh, I advocate that we continue rolling out the quadrivalent vaccine uh, like uh, we're good at doing it in Canada. My name is Samantha Collins. I'm an OBGYN in Fredericton. I was actually going to ask about the non-avalent vaccine, so you've answered the question. Um, I will ask instead about, um, and I apologize if I missed this right at the beginning, um, is there still uh, similar data between the bivalent vaccine with regards to um, its benefit in older women um, and that slight increase in protection against the oncogenic um, HPV strains in terms of you know what we quote the amount of protection uh, that's provided between the quadrivalent and the and the bivalent, um, with the adjuvant that's added into the bivalent, uh, my understanding is that it's a bit better for older women, and that's usually the population that I advocate it for. Is that evidence still as strong, or is there any new evidence in that regard? So I think we want to speak to the fact that the bivalent has immunogenicity data, but not necessarily endpoint data. Eduardo, can you? Comment? Well, uh, the, the very excellent vaccine. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I don't quite hear. You know, there's the echo here, so I'm not sure I understood every every uh, uh, angle of your question here. But it has to do with the differences between the two vaccines. That's essentially, the point that you're yes. trying to raise. And particularly the, midlife the, women. Yeah. And midlife women. Older women. Well, for older women, uh, we do have different angles. I mean, different clinical trials designed in different ways. So it's not a directly comparable level of evidence for all practical purposes. They are equally efficacious. We do have, uh, there are 
trials had had comparison have indicated high immunogenicity for the bivalent vaccine on an exact head to head comparison. But this extra immunogenicity has not translated in actual efficacy okay. in the long run. Whether there, there, of course, we uh, discussions with respect to whether uh, cross protection would vary between the two vaccines, duration of protection would vary. Well, we haven't gotten that evidence, so I would hate to speculate. For the time being, the only thing we can actually uh, put our teeth on is that they're both highly efficacious and uh, whatever they are applied, that it works very well. Is there evidence with the immunogenicity of the quadrivalent vaccine to suggest, I know that we don't know exactly what level of immunogenicity is gonna provide clinical protection, but um, for that women in the older sort of over 30 population, um, is there enough uh, clinical endpoint data for the quadrivalent vaccine to suggest that's appropriate in that population as well? Well, it all hinges on duration of these trials, right? So we have the longest observation period is for what Dr. Slavane just mentioned for the prototype HPV-16 vaccine, which passed a little 10 years in terms of observation mm -hmm. and documented. Uh, the other trials, the phase two and the phase three trials have gotten to an end and eventually there was a crossover. So both groups were vaccinated. So they're no longer being, going to be observed. Phase four trials, monitoring trials, which have been implemented in Scandinavian countries, uh, they have the duty of look, looking at very long-term protection. And of course, we have all the surveillance data of countries in countries that have implemented vaccination, except it's not at the level of uh, randomized control trial data. It, one of the, the ways we get excited about is that by looking at the impact of vaccination, even in countries that haven't had a great deal of uh, penetration, such as the US, at most 40% adoption of HIV vaccination, the impact has been so tremendous. And there has also a role of uh, herd immunity, which has been higher than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. So this is, adds to the body of good news that we have seen for other things. So the expectation is that it's going to be long-term protection and that exactly the period that we need to protect that, that cervix, that vulnerability period between the ages of onset of sexual behavior up until age 25 or so. Thank you. I would just. Mark. I would just add that immunogenicity was never accepted as an endpoint for uh, the WHO and the uh, licensing authorities because both Merck and GSK had to develop their own uh, serological assay, did not exist in the public. And just a word of, of uh, caution, uh, I'm gonna be publishing in Eduardo's <laughs> paper and presenting in Seattle, we don't see the herd immunity in Quebec for men, so don't say to everyone because it's going to be presented in Seattle, but okay. herd immunity might be very Australian. So we're going to take our two last questions before we ask you to complete your summaries and your evaluations of today's session. Over here. I'm Hal Lawrence from ACOG in the United States. Dr. Franco, I think I heard you say just a minute ago, we were talking about squamous cell and then you said basal cell. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, you did. Yeah. And, well, there's. So tell, tell. I want to learn a little bit about how the impact of HPV, HPV vaccine on the prevalence uh, of basal cells. Well, not this vaccines, of course. These vaccines are exclusively for a number of types within the alpha papillomavirus uh, mm -hmm. uh, genus. So the the ones of concern for for skin carcinomas, for uh, uh, we're talking about the beta the beta papillomavirus. So when I say that the hope for the future is that the pipeline of, of vaccine uh, research, well, the third or fourth generation that's coming out there, capsomeres, eventually we're going to have VLP-based or cas capsomere-based vaccines or, or combination uh, uh, hybrid vaccines in terms of different, different uh, subunits of the virus that would give us pangenous protection for alpha and then eventually, who knows, eventually broad alpha papilloma viridi protection for all of these, you know, uh, all of these models, not only cutaneous, but also the cutaneous type. We're talking about hope here, because in proof of concept it already exists and it's doable. The question is whether we're going to bring those quick enough for clinical trials to, uh, to operate. But as you can see from the data that's coming, uh, the, the, the most recent evidence for the, and uh, Dr. Ellett had the slide that showed 5.5% or so, 5% or so, uh, of cancers associated with HPV infection. Right. So of all the infection associated cancers, HPV represents a major proportion. And this is only the, the, the tip of the iceberg because we haven't factored in yet the uh, other HPVs associated for, uh, with uh, skin cancers yet. And that's, of course, as you know, a huge burden of disease out there. 
Thank Unfortunately, you. we're going to have to end now, but the good news is, is that if you want more <laughs> HPV data, at 3.45, Dr. Franco will be joined by Dr. Mark Einstein, and it will be another ongoing session, different from this session, on HPV and the impact of its disease.